Isn't it good to hear that being played again? Let her know how much you appreciate her ministry. Well, my mother was a fine Christian woman. I thank the Lord for her. She led me to the Lord when I was 10 years old. And because of her prayers, I amounted to something in life, hopefully. <laughs> Came to know the Lord. She, I know that she was always praying for me, even when I was in the service in the Air Force during the Vietnam thing. I know that it's my mother's prayers that were answered. And so as I sing this song, I'd like to not only share it with you, but I would like to present it to my mother in heaven. If I could hear my mother pray again. How sweet and happy seem those days of which I dream when memory recalls them now and then and with what rapture sweet my weary heart would beat if I will hear my mother shining gospel way so trusting still his love I seek that home above where I shall meet my mother some glad day if I could only hear my mother pray again if I could only hear her sweet tender voice as then how happy I would be it would mean so much to me if I could hear my mother pray again her work on earth is done the life crown has been won and she will be at rest with him above and some glad morning she i know will welcome me to that eternal home of peace and love if i could only hear my mother pray again if i could only hear her sweet tender voice as then how happy I would be it would mean so much to me if I could hear my mother pray again
If you have a copy of God's Word, Matthew 26 this morning, Matthew 26. And uh, as we uh, begin reading this morning, I'll start our reading. Well, let's, uh, let's just start in verse 50. While you're turning, I'll bring you up to speed. Uh, the Lord is, uh, he's, he's told, mentioned to Peter, before the cock shall crow thri- uh, twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. Time is elapsed and passed, and now the Lord is in the garden of Gethsemane. He's going to be betrayed. Uh, in the midst of being betrayed, there's some things that transpire. For an example, uh, they come, and how in the world, and what I don't know what all is meant here, but it's a, uh, there's some good thoughts here. Uh, but it said they took him. How in the world you take the creator of the world and take him away? I'll never understand that other than submissiveness. They took him, and as they take him away, uh, a man by the name of Malchus puts his hands on the Lord, and before you know it, Peter's poured his sword out and took off his ear. How many of you remember that story? Well, in the midst of that, once that man's ear is cut off, the Lord stretches forth his hand and touches that man's ear and heals him. And there is a thought there. I'm not preaching here, but this is just food for thought. Uh, the Lord, out of everything he could have done for this man, he touched his ears. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And he wanted to make sure this man could hear the word of God. Well, after that transpires, uh, the Lord gives a message to the disciples. And he is uh, homing in on them and letting them know that there's going to be some difficult days coming. And I want us to pick our reading up there in verse 50. Well, look in verse 51. Verse 51, And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword in his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Watch verse 53. It's a key verse. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels here's the uh, here's the verse I'm going to preach from and I don't know it may be several weeks maybe one Sunday we'll know here in a little bit verse 54 is a key verse but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be And I want to preach to you on the thought this morning, the path to Calvary, it must be. Heavenly Father, we love you today. We are grateful for your goodness. We thank you for for such a path as this. We don't understand it all. and Lord, uh, according to your word, it'll take all the ages to begin to Write the books that would contain the things that your son done for mankind. And I pray you'd help us as we uh, endeavor to preach the word of God. And Lord, uh, we're in need of uh, your guidance. Uh, The more I preach, the more I'm aware of how I can do nothing without you. And unless you breathe upon the Bible this morning, it'll just be another gathering just more music, just more obedience, which is a good thing. But we need God in our midst. And I'm asking this morning that you'd honor the Bible, that you'd speak to our hearts. We'll love you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a path to Calvary that the Lord is going to take. And he makes the statement, It must be. In other words, there's some things that are going to transpire, Peter. And if you think that by these men just laying their hands on me, that uh, I'm not going to be touched, son, you've missed the whole message. 
There's some things that must be that are going to transpire that you're going to need to endure and look at and look long and hard at what goes on because Peter didn't know it, but just a few days, Peter's going to stand on the day of Pentecost and these things that must be on the path of Calvary, Peter's going to begin to preach them and uh, 3,000 people get saved from the things that must be. And I want us to look this morning, first of all, uh, to begin to explain what he means, what I think he means rather, is going to first of all be found in Matthew 26 and 27. Now I'm by no means saying that you won't find these things in other gospels or in other places in the Bible. But primarily what I'm wanting to preach this morning is revealed in Matthew 26 and chapter 27. This morning, I first of all, I want us to look in verse 65, Matthew 26. Turn there with me if you would, just a couple pages back. Matthew 26. And I think I'm in 27 here. Hold on just a minute. 26, 65. All right, Matthew 26, 65. And while we're reading that, um, let's just start our reading in, in verse uh, 61. And he said, uh, verse 62 rather, And the high priest arose. Now, I want to put in your mind the seat of the high priest. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit, the Sanhedrin. I, I want you to know he's used to sitting, Okay. Notice verse 62. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnessed against thee? But Jesus held his peace. In other words, Christ voluntarily took on every accusation that they made. And he didn't try to defend it or try to say they were wrong or right. Isaiah said, Like a lamb to the slaughter, yet openeth he not his mouth. But in verse 63, but Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee, watch this, by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, thou sayest, thou hast said, nevertheless I said unto you hereafter, uh, shall ye see, watch it, the Son of Man. If you, got, if you mark in your Bible, you ought to mark that right there. The Son of Man sitting. You see that? <laughs> oh, we're going to have fun with this sitting. You shall see the Son of, Man sitting on, Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we? Uh, what further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blaspheming. What think ye? And they answered and said, He is guilty of death. Now watch this. Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? Now here's what I want us to see. On the way, the path to Calvary, in this particular passage, the Lord is before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. And they brought him there, before he goes to Calvary to put him on literally what was an illegal trial, by the way. And they put him on trial and they begin to make accusation after accusation against the Lord. Uh, for example, this man said that he would rear the temple in three days when it was 30 years in, in building. And they were trying everything they could do to twist our Lord's words. But when it got on him being guilty of some things, the Lord held his peace. He never said a word. He just let it go, let them go on and on. And it comes down here to where they're going to accuse him and charge. Actually, there's a charge. There's a courtroom. He's going from one court session to another 
uh, where he's leaving. He's going to be in a court session, if you will, from the Sanhedrin uh, in front of uh, Caiaphas. And then they're really going to put the political power on him and take him to Pilate here in a moment. Uh, but before he goes to Pilate, before Caiaphas, he is accused of blaspheming God. In other words, this man is an evil speaker. He is a very vile person. He has totally lived a life of public speech contrary to the word of God is what they're saying. This man is blasphemed almighty God. What think ye? And they said he is guilty of death. So right here in Caiaphas', Caiaphas judgment hall where Caiaphas is judging legally they have accused and committed the Lord and passed judgment on him being guilty of blaspheming. The way he speaks the things he has done, the things he's spoken, they brought dishonor and disloyalty and, and, and heresy was come out of his mouth according to these men. He's defamed almighty God and he's guilty of death. And they passed that law. And they passed it. And the Bible says the men begin to clear their throats. And spit in our Lord's face. They spit in his face. And they took their hands, the palms of their hands right here. The word mean the word buffet means they would take this part of their hand behind actually he had a hood on, and I can prove that from the scriptures. He was led to Caiaphas. The word led means this. They put a a, a towel or a rag over our Lord, a shroud. That's where they get, you ever seen that where they say they claim they found it where they'll have the stained blood of our Lord? I don't know about all that, but I do know this is true. He, they put that shroud over his face or that rag, if you will, and beat him with the palms of their hands. And they were literally taunting the Lord saying, yeah, if you're really God, why don't you tell us who's hitting you Prophesy unto us, who is he that smote thee? And they went around there, watch it now, and buffeted him and beat him. And as they finished beating him, they spit on him and accused him of speaking blasphemy. Now I got to think about this. Out of all the things to accuse our Lord for, Boy, they not even know we're close. Everything he did was to fulfill the scriptures. And so he is preparing the disciples for what is going to transpire here. If you think that they're just going to touch me, they see, Peter didn't like it when they laid their hands on him. He pulled that sword off. He said, hey, put that sword up. He said, don't you realize that all I'd have to do is pray and my father would send more than 12 legions of angels? He said, Peter, you need to understand something here. All this is being played out according to my father's perfect will. Everything that's transpiring here. Mankind is going to beat and buffet me and you need to prepare for it because it's the path to Calvary and it must be. It must be. Now, after he had spoken this, uh, these words about the Son of Man sitting, did you hear him what he said? The high priest, actually what you'll find, I don't know how it was in Caiaphas' courts. I would say it's very similar. But in Pilate's courts, I do know how it was. In Pilate's courts, we're going to look here in a moment, and it said there was a band of soldiers that's the Roman ban. Now the ban, the word ban in the Greek text means coal. It's a coal. So if you will, when you walked in Pilate's judgment hall, friend, Pilate would be, the governor Pilate would be in a seat high up and everything from that building, listen, the Roman soldiers would come in and they would coal themselves. They would wrap themselves completely many of them around the building, a band of soldiers. In other words, 
they would not only instill it through Pilate, but symbolism was saying, you're now in a place of authority. You're here and you're not going to be able to do anything about it because we're controlling this situation. That's the Roman government. So when you come into Pilate's judgment hall, that's where you're going. Now, you know Caiaphas says, send him on to Pilate. I'm not dealing with this man. Uh Uh-uh. And so now he's sent to Pilate. And the Bible says, and and one of our texts that I want to deal with this morning is this, that the Lord Jesus walked in before Pilate and Jesus stood before Pilate. You see that? Let's look in the text real quick. Matthew 27, 11, look at it. Matthew chapter 27, you got it? Look in verse 11. And Jesus stood before the governor, which is Pilate. And the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he had accused him, of the chief priests and the elders and answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Marveled greatly. Now here's what I want us to look at is this. Verse 27. Then the soldiers of the government took Jesus into the common hall, And gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. Now this is an entire, the number's too many here for me to trace the number. The whole band of soldiers. In other words, he come before Pilate, watch it. And you see him standing. Now when you come into Pilate's judgment hall, those that were standing in a circle were a symbol of authority and the only one in that building that was sitting, from what I can understand, was Pilate. And when one was put on charge, he would come and they would stand before the authority. In other words, he's being put on trial, he's being judged for something, and Jesus, verse 11, stood before Pilate. Oh, man. Here you've got the Roman government, and they're fixing to enforce obedience, is what you see. In other words, we've told you to quit preaching. We've we've tried to put this message out. You're not listening. You've been tried and convicted of blasphemy for, before Caiaphas. Now we're going to enforce obedience in your life. And before he's crucified, he's brought in. Watch it now. On the inner circle, I don't know how many of the audience of here, but they are armed Roman soldiers And there is a band, there is a massive number of these soldiers who have coiled completely around this exterior judgment room. And in the center of this room is our Lord. And above him sits a man by the name of Pilate, the government. And as those soldiers look upon him, the Bible says this. It says they come out after they had spitten in his face repeatedly, beat him to a pulp at Caiaphas' judgment hall. They come out, I personally believe, and I've got proof of this in just a moment, just hang with me. They take that shroud off of him because I don't believe Jesus, I know he had strength here and he had it on the cross, but after someone had come and beaten you in the face and kicked you and spit on you for God only knows how long, you probably wouldn't feel too good. But they took that, I I believe they took that mask off and focused him toward Pilate who was a symbol of authority. 
You've been brought here under authority. And now no matter what you say or whatever you do, we're fixing to enforce in, in obedience in your life and you're going to do as you're told. And there stands the Prince of Heaven, friend. Saliva running down his face. Blood running down through his eyes where he had been beaten. And the enforcement starts. He looks around and the Roman soldiers have made a tight coil. No one's getting out of here till this thing's over with. We know better. I can hear Peter off to the distance. Broken hearted Peter and John looking on from a distance. Cannot I come pray unto my Father and him send more than 12 legions of angels? The Lord could have done it, but you know what they done? The Roman soldiers come out and they stripped him naked. Completely naked. You look at the Bible. Keep the Bible like it is. They stripped him naked in front of all those grown men. And they took a reed, which is like a, actually a reed grows in a swamp or a marshy area. Uh, area. It's much like a cane pole. How many of you know what I'm, how many of you have ever been cane pole feet? Boy, I'm preaching now, ain't I? But you take that cane pole, them cane poles, they can get thick at the bottom, about like an inch around. And they took that there, and the Bible says they scourged him. With him being naked, those Roman soldiers would come around and they were spitting on him and they were taking them cane poles, if you will, and they were literally whipping him like a dog. Prophesy unto us. Who is he that smote thee? And the whole time in authority sits Pilate as he watches. I know Pilate washed his hands before he sent him to Calvary, but he had him scourged. And they beat our Lord like an animal into an un overwhelming pool of blood. Matter of fact, I traced the, some of the scourgings. And when they got to the cat of nine tails, it was said through the life of the apostle Paul that if a man lived through a scourging, most of the time he would be standing in a pool of blood staring down at the floor with some of his internal organs on the ground where they had beat him. They spit on him, they mocked him, and they whipped him like a dog for you and I. I got to look at that the other day and I said, my, my, my. God allowing this this world to enforce this kind of authority upon the Son of God. Why would the Lord ever, and I know Christ became sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God, but I got hung up on something here. I don't know exactly where the Lord wants to go with it, but after they, in the midst of stripping him, after they had spit on him and beat him, Somewhere about middle ways, they robed him in a scarlet robe. Do you see that? It's in the text. Matthew 27, they robed him in a scarlet robe. In other words, if he's going to be a king, we'll just make him a king. And they put that scarlet robe on him, and they took that reeds, those cane poles, if you will, and they put one in his hand as it was a scepter, and the other they began to smote him on the head before they planted a crown of thorns on his head. They went through that entire belittling and shaming of God's son to the point that Scott, Pilate let it go on for a while. And now it's time to go to Calvary. And before Calvary, I noticed something here, Brother Greg. As many years as I've read it, I've never seen this before in my life. Now, I'm sure some of y'all may have read it a hundred times and noticed it. 
Now it's time to go to Calvary. The Roman government is, is probably, and, and some of the Sanhedrin is probably all that were there when they scourged him. I don't know if there was any public eye there or not. If you come up with that, you let me know. But right now, I'm confined to believe there was the Sanhedrin and the Roman soldiers, the band of soldiers that was around him. But after they beat our Lord, Matthew 27 and 26, at 27 is where I'm at. After they beat him, and mocked him with that robe. They took the scarlet robe off. Have you ever saw that? They took that scarlet robe off. See, that scarlet robe was a symbol of a king. They took it off, and they put his own raiment on him before he went to Calvary. And here's what I believe the message is. We're not sending one down there and putting him up on Golgotha and going up Calvary, emphasizing, even beginning to assemble, uh, to send a symbol that he was a king. No, 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 no. You put his own raiment on him, his own clothing. Now think about this. The birds of the air have nests. Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Christ didn't have hardly anything, and probably what was on him was knitted to him and handed to him by his mother, Mary. I can prove that. And so I'm going to say that clothing, that raiment that was placed on him was what his mother had sewn without without seeing, if you look at that, if you ever get to looking at that, that coat that she sold Jesus. I believe they put his own raiment on him, the Bible says, and they sent him to Calvary and crucified him as a poor, blaspheming sinner. My, my, my. We take the gospel and what God's done for us so for granted. I'm telling you right now, friend, there's coming a time, and the Lord was trying to tell Caiaphas, if there's anybody going to sit in authority, it's going to be me. Amen. The Lord ought to have been sitting in authority that day rather than Caiaphas. But friend, do you realize this morning what the God of heaven has done for you and I through the obedience of the Lord Jesus and how he died and shed his blood for you and I. They beat him like an animal and treated animals better than they treated the Lord. Yet he openeth not his mouth like a lamb to the slaughter, Isaiah says. I'd ask you this just before she comes. She's going to play something on the piano for us this morning. Matter of fact, stand with me to your feet if you would. Somebody said, preacher, this is not too dynamic of preaching. Well, I tell you this much, friend. If the gospel and what the Lord went through doesn't touch our hearts, Nothing will. Amen. And I just ask you this morning, as no one's looking around, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, she's going to begin to softly play. Somebody said, I never, know the, never knew the Lord went through something like that, preacher. Yeah, and he did it for you, friend. God did that for you. And you know, maybe you're here this morning, you say, no doubt in my heart, I know that I'm a Christian. I know I'm a Christian. And maybe it's been a little while since in the adoration in your heart and appreciation that you've got along somewhere and you really, the Holy Spirit of God has revealed to you a part of what Christ done for you today at Calvary. And maybe as a child of God in obedience, you slip out from where you are and come down to an old-fashioned altar and in reverence toward God Almighty, say, Lord, I'm so glad that I'm a Christian. I and I'm grateful for what you've done for me. You could have called more than 12 legions of angels, but you, 
voluntarily suffered for me. You voluntarily bled. Men cleared their throats and beat you like an animal and you could have walked away from there. You could have been sitting in authority in that place. But for me, loving me that much, no one's ever loved me like that. One more time on this side of Calvary, God, I want you to know I'm grateful for your love. Some are coming. Friend, would you do that this morning? Maybe you're here and you've never truly been saved. Greater love hath no man than a man lay down his life for his friend. Jesus paid it all, the songwriter said. He paid it all. Some more coming, friend. You need to come. Would you do that? Maybe you're here and you say, Preacher, no doubt I know I'm saved. But you just want to come and bow in reverence to God and say, Lord, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that you lived a life of humility. I'm so grateful. And you know what I think those clothes represent? His own clothes, his own raiment. God becoming man. I may be wrong, but it's a picture of the Son of Man becoming uh, human, taking on the form of a sir, uh, form of a, a man, and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. That's what he was trying to say to Pilate. It's coming today, the Son of Man's coming. And you're going to see him sitting in power, friend. And this morning, you'd be willing to bow. You'd bow now. You say, Lord, I'm in need of you. Maybe you're hearing your child of God before we close. Right now, things not going so well for you. You need God. Friend, I want to tell you this much. If God would die for you in such a way and go through such pain and agony on the path to Calvary and then Calvary itself, there's nothing the Lord won't do for a child of God as long as it's in God's will. And maybe you're here this morning and you're in need of the Lord's touch in your life. Would you slip out? Would you quit being uh, stubborn and just, and, and just slip out? And look at the way they interrogated the Lord Jesus and put him through literal hell for you. And today he is sitting in heaven, in the third heaven, on the throne of this universe. And God loves you with an everlasting love. And maybe today you need to come, as some have already come. Maybe you're here and you say, Preacher, I don't feel inclined to come to the altar. But just before we close, no, no ifs and buts about it. No doubt in my mind, the Holy Spirit of God's laid His finger upon my heart today. And just out of reverence and in love to Him, I want Him to know I heard His voice. Is that you? You slip your hand up. God bless your heart. I see your hands, hands all over. I see them. I see them. The Lord does too. It's been good to be in the Lord's house. And I trust God spoke to your heart. Let's be dismissed in the word of prayer. It's so good to have Brother Burrow here with us this morning. And uh, so good to have him. Brother, Brother Burrow can come. None of y'all got no excuse not to be here. Brother Burrow, it's been good to have you, friend. Why don't you ask God's blessing on the remainder of this day and dismiss us if you would, please. And you don't have to stand. You can, you can pray sitting down there, friend. It'd be fine, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, it truly is great to be here and listen to the sound of your word, apply it to our individual lives, and one day know, to one and one day know soon we'll be with you in heaven.